All right, thank you very much. So first of all, uh, thanks a lot to Daniel and the rest of the organizers uh, to, to, to put the, uh, the summer and our winter school together. I'm really excited to, to share with you some of uh, our latest results looking at uh, how chromatin conformation um, changes in this is, is, is arranged during early embryonic development. So my group is interested in understanding the spatial organization of the genome, and in particular, how the two meter long molecule of DNA that is in most of your cells is encapsulated in a few micronucleus, and how this tremendous level of compaction occurs while all of the regulatory mechanisms that make your genomes work properly, such as, for example, looping between enhancers and promoters to regulate gene expression, keep doing so. So I think yesterday you already uh, saw beautiful examples of how uh, one can use imaging approaches to try and see how this tremendous level of compaction occurs. Um, and what I'm gonna be talking to you about today is a slightly different technique uh, that essentially uses sequencing to allow us to look at how the three-dimensional uh, chromatin conformation is arranged uh, in the nucleus. And in particular, uh, I'm gonna be talking about high c um, And I'm gonna give you a brief introduction just to make sure that we're all in the same page when we uh, try and interpret the data that I'm gonna be showing later. So as I mentioned, hi c is a technique uh, that was developed in the Optecker's lab and allows us to capture the conformation of DNA in the nucleus. And the way this works is we're crosslink um, cross cells. In, in the particular case that I'll show you later, it's going to be embryos. Uh, and what this is going to do is it's going to make any two particular regions of the genome that could be in close proximity, so in close linear proximity or far away in the linear uh, sequence of the, of the genome, if they're together in, in physical proximity, they're going to be cross-linked together. So now that we have fixed um, this uh, chromatin organization, in order to be able to detect which regions were close to each other, the first thing that we do is we digest the genome into millions of pieces using restriction enzymes. Um, so these restriction enzymes are going to leave these overhangs here, um, and they're going to generate these fragments um, that essentially are going to be uh, close to all of these original points of, uh, of contact. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the overhangs that the restriction enzymes um, leave in order to fill these, uh, these overhangs with biotinylated nucleotides. And in, in such a way, we can then know which regions of the genome have been cut. Now, the next step involves letting these fragments to re-ligate. And by doing that, what happens is that a new chimeric DNA fragment that didn't exist before um, forms, where you have the blue part uh, of, of the linear sequence over here, now followed by the orange part. Um, and as I, as I mentioned before, a key uh, feature here is that these ligations are going to be close by to those regions uh, that were uh, in close physical uh, proximity. So now from here, we remove the proteins and shear the DNA, and we use the biotinylated nucleotides to be able to pull down those fragments that contain the specific uh, new ligations. And then we use Illumina parent sequencing in order to be able to identify the left hand side of, the, of this new chimeric read and the right hand side of this new chimeric read. So now how does this look like? Well, imagine that you have a toy genome that has these five different pieces. So this will be against the genome against the genome. Our sequencing libraries are going to generate all of, the, all of these different fragments where I have color coded uh, where in the genome that fragment will, will belong to. So what we do now is we map separately the left hand side and the right hand side of the fragment um, back to the original genome. And this is going to uh, give us a, a certain amount of reads that are going to come from different places. So particularly here, you see that around the diagonal, you, we're going to see a lot of uh, reads uh, coming from regions that were close in the linear, uh, in the linear proximity. But then you'll have some reads that might be like this one over here, where you have a little bit of, so you have this part here in yellow and this part in blue. And if we have a lot of these reads, what that would mean is that a, a certain amount of times, the region, um, the blue region here was in close proximity with the yellow region over here. Now, in order to be able to interpret this easily, what we do is we transform this into a color, into a color scale. And because this matrix is symmetric, we just double the, color, the, the, the matrix here at the top. And essentially, this is what um, a high C uh, matrix is. Now, how does this look like if we go and have a look at a, a real example? Well, so this is, a, this is a real example. This comes from Drosophila cells, so from, from fruit fly cells. And what I have done here is I'm showing you the frequency of uh, contact, essentially frequency of contacts that were identified 
for the entire genome. And I have put all of the chromosomes and chromosomal arms in both axes. Uh, and this, I'm showing this at 50 kb resolution. So essentially, each dot here will correspond to a 50 kilobase uh, bin. Now, if here what I have done is I have put this grid line that separates the different chromosomes and the different chromosomal arms. But even if I wouldn't have done that, you would immediately see that the data here have structure. And in particular, what you see is these squares, uh, where you see that there is many more contacts for regions that belong to a given chromosomal arm than the contacts that they have either with the other chromosomal arm or with the other chromosomes. And this is something very similar to what you, show, to what you saw in this uh, fish image that I showed you in, the, in one of the previous slides um, uh, that actually shows the existence of these chromosome territories. So regions of, uh, of a given chromosomal arm will then have their own space in the nucleus. Um, so this is very good. It sort of recapitulates what we can see with some of the fish data. Um, but the nice thing about high data is that we can start zooming in. So now I have zoomed in into an entire chromosomal arm. Um, and I'm going to zoom in even more um, at this particular level, um, where you see more squares. OK, so now this is uh, going to be a region of about 3 megabases at 10 kb resolution. So each dot now corresponds to a 10 kilobase uh, bin. And what you see is more squares. And in particular, you see those, those squares over here um, that are indicative of domains. So what, what, what will happen in this particular regions is that the chromatin that belongs to this domain tends to interact quite a lot with itself, but it's fairly insulated from a region that will be not so far away in the genome. So for example, the region over here that will be forming its own domain, but there's not going to be a lot of intermingling between these two particular, between these two particular domains. Um, and this is what you will have uh, heard as uh, TADs or uh, contact domains, and there's different names for, 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 for these domains. I'm going to call them topological domains or chromatin domains. Or I'll try and keep consistent with my nomenclature. Now, as I've said, this matrix is symmetric. Um, so for a lot of the data that I'm going to show you later, sometimes I'm, I'm going to show the full matrix like this. But other times, what I'm going to do, just because it's easy to put all the tracks uh, around this data, is I'm just going to rotate this matrix 45 degrees, and I'm only going to show half of it. So now these domains are going to appear as triangles. OK, so now that we're done with the, the highs introduction, um, what I'm going to be talking uh, for the rest of the talk today, actually, has to do with three-dimensional chromatin organization during early embryonic development. And I'm going to be focusing particularly in early embryonic development in flies. Now, my interest is really, uh, so my lab is really interested in early embryonic development for two main reasons. So the first reason is that from an epigenetic point of view, this is a this is a super interesting um, uh, developmental stage because uh, early embryonic development this is a stage where the fully differentiated epigenetic uh, programs of the gametes, so the gametes are going to be some of the most uh, differentiated cells, uh, specific cells that we have in our bodies, need to be reverted back to a totipotent state after fertilization. So then a new organism can actually develop from, from this single cell uh, uh, cycle. And in, in Drosophila, uh, which is what I'm going to be talking about today, this is actually quite interesting because there's a number of uh, uh, rounds of nuclear division that will happen after fertilization in which the zygotic genome is silent. Okay, so and this is going to be important for later. So this is one of the reasons why we look at early embryonic development. The other reason is because this is really pretty and you cannot stop looking at these videos ever. So the video here is going to show a Drosophila embryo developing. So this is a fly line that we obtained from uh, Shelby Blythe uh, at Eric Vishhouse lab. And this fly line has uh, a, fluorescent, a fluorescent protein, a PCNA, that essentially will label, will label the nuclei. So you can see here all of the nuclei very synchronously dividing. And you see the nuclear cycles over here. So now at two and a half hours post-fertilization in nuclear cycle 14, this is the first time that the embryo starts expressing its own genes. So it starts essentially using their own genes for, for to drive development, which is going to lead to gastrulation, which is what you're going to see happening here, um, by which specific pockets of tissue start to form. And then this determines um, how the embryo is going to form the different tissue layers. And what you saw here appearing while I was showing this video is nuclear cycle specific high C maps of all of these different uh, nuclear cycles that we have seen in this, uh, in, in this transition. And no matter whether you have looked at a lot of high C data or not before, but what you can tell is that this um, 
these maps look, so this is always the same region, and then these maps look really very different in the different nuclear cycles. And this is quite remarkable because, you know, so this movie, I, I played it a little bit of a fast pace, um, but the nuclear cycles here will, so the, the embryo will move from one nuclear cycle to another nuclear cycle in essentially at around 20 minutes uh, time. So this is really a fast paced transition. Um, so essentially we use this system to try and see what's happening here. What, what, are, what are the changes and, and what are these changes uh, related to? And to do that, um, the first thing that we did was to look at the region of the genome that I'm showing you here at nuclear cycle 12. So this is before the major wave of cytotic genome activation. So when most of the genome is actually silent, um, except for a few regions that are going to be transcribed. So I, I forgot to mention that there's a minor wave of cytotic genome activation starting at around nuclear cycle eight. Um, and what we want is we want to look at the region at nuclear cycle 12 that had the highest level of chromatin conformation, which is this one over here. So you can see that there are some regions here that have a gain of insulation. Uh, and what I'm plotting here in this heat map is uh, essentially insulation score calculated at a range of window sizes, really clearly showing that there is some specific regions in the genome here that uh, have a high level of insulation. And we were really, really very surprised when we had a look at this data because what we were able to observe is that there was almost a perfect correlation between this uh, levels of the levels of insulation that we'll have at nuclear cycle 12 and binding of RNA pole 2 in this embryo. So this is also RNA pole 2 binding specifically for, uh, for embryos at nuclear cycle 12. And what this really shows is that uh, these boundaries that you can see forming uh, in our case as early as nuclear cycle 12, because this is the earliest cycle that we looked at, uh, seem to be associated with transcriptionally active loci. Now we want them to look at what other things would be associated here. And then what we also saw is that these boundaries uh, were enriched in open chromatin. So to, to, to actually show this, what we did is we were, we were able to use ataxic data uh, coming from Eric Fischer's lab. Um, so these plots here, what they show is they show the um, average uh, open uh, chromatin levels around um, these domain boundaries, specifically, and th then we break this down in, in boundaries that have been established in nuclear cycle 12, 13, and 14. And, and what you can see here is that these boundaries are enriched in open chromatin. This was quite useful because it allowed us to run motif enrichment analysis recognition to see which specific motifs were, um, uh, were popping up in these regions of open chromatin. Um, and here, this, uh, some of the motifs actually that are quite interesting. For example, we have the GAGA motif over here. We also have motif binding one uh, protein uh, enriched in, this, in these regions. And one in particular that we were very happy that we got um, was actually the top hit at nuclear cycle 12 because this is the binding site for the pioneer transcription factor CELDA, which has been shown before to be a master regulator of cyclotic genome activation in Drosophila. So to recap at this stage, what we have seen is that um, there is actually quite a dramatic change of chromatin conformation around cyclotic genome activation. So before cyclotic genome activation, the genome seems to be fairly relaxed. So almost you know, not, not really a lot of chromatin organization, except for some regions that seem to have high levels of insulation. And what I have shown you so far is that those regions are bound by rna 2 and by CELDA. And then upon cygotic genome activation in the transition between nuclear cycle 13 and 14, what happens is that the genome acquires the general features that you would observe uh, in, in these 3D chromatin maps, including compartments, uh, chromatin domains, um, and, and, and a specific uh, loop. So I'm not going to show you a lot about this today. Now, this obviously immediately prompted the question of uh, whether there is a role for active transcription in establishing this conformation, because we see a very clear link here for those regions that have early uh, establishment of insulation to be associated with rna 2 binding. And we think, so this is also another reason why we chose this system to, to, to look at this, um, because you need to realize that transcription is inactive naturally in the early stages of Drosophila development. It's the same as, as in us, it's just us, maybe it comes out in the well, in mammals uh, between two and four cell stage. Um, so as I've said before, in Drosophila, there is a minor wave of cytotic genome activation that starts at around nuclear cycle eight. So what we wanted to do here was using the fact that those embryos are, not, are naturally not transcribing, we wanted to block transcription early enough to make sure that those embryos were not going to transcribe ever and see what will happen with their 3D genome. 
So to do this, essentially, we uh, inject these embryos with one of two drugs, so either alpha-manitin that blocks transcriptional elongation or triptolite that blocks transcription initiation and before nuclear cycle eight. And as I've said, this is really very important because we inject these embryos inside the, cyto the cytoplasm. I, I should say, at this stage, the embryo is a syncytial blastoderm. So essentially, you have a big cell uh, with many different nuclei, um, but you just have one cell membrane, except for the pole cells, but uh, we'll forget about this for the time being. So we inject, we inject embryos with this transcription, uh, tra transcription inhibitors before there's a chance for these embryos to start transcribing. And then we let these embryos develop until nuclear cycle 14 at around uh, two and a half hours post-fertilization. Um, and then we perform high C uh, on those embryos. Now, I should say that the embryos can actually do this because uh, development at these initial stages is driven by maternally deposited gene products uh, and RNA uh, that come in, in, in the egg. So first of all, we check that these embryos, uh, so the embryos that we treat are uh, transcriptionally silent. And to do this, actually, we did uh, rna pol 2 chip -seq, um, for alpha manitin treated and triptolite treated embryos. And what you can see here uh, is particularly, so you know, so you can see two things. So first of all, when we treat embryos with alpha manitin or triptolite, we lose binding at the body of the genes, but we keep binding at the promoters. And this is the expected behavior of these drugs. Um, because the drugs are not actually uh, precluding the recruitment of polymerase. And I think this is important for the, for the, uh, for the implications uh, of, of what we're showing here. Um, and then we use um, uh, qPCR to actually check that those genes that are the first genes that are, mater that are zygotically expressed are uh, not expressed when we block uh, transcription. And you can see here for alpha manitin treated and triptolite treated embryos, uh, so essentially we have about 99% uh, uh, level, 99.9% uh, level of, uh, of uh, decrease uh, transcription for, for those genes. So these embryos are transcriptionally silent. So what happens then with the 3D gene? So we perform the experiments for water-treated embryos, just to make sure that changing slightly the volume of the, of the embryo was not going to have any effect here. And as you can see uh, in, the, in the difference, uh, so in the fall change between the, the untreated and water-treated embryos, there's pretty much no differences. We have a look at the level of insulation, and they seem very, very similar levels of insulation. Now, very surprisingly, and we, this was, you know, we, it, it was, it, we were really very surprised uh, about this. Um, if you have a look at uh, alpha manitin treated embryos or triptolite treated embryos, it doesn't matter. I'm, on, I'm only going to show you alpha manitin uh, for, for, for the sake of time. What you can see is that these embryos still have these domains, still form these domains. And this was very surprising. And actually, you can conclude two things from this. So the first uh, thing that you can conclude is that transcription is not necessary in order to be able to, for these embryos to get their three-dimensional chromatin conformation, because these embryos have never tr transcribed, because we block transcription way earlier than they would go and transcribe at those particular regions. And second, uh, and very importantly, because these embryos never transcribe, whatever molecular mechanisms are involved in generating this three-dimensional chromatin organization must be maternally deposited, because this is, you know, they need to come from, from whatever was loaded by the mother in the egg. Now, if you have a look at these maps, they look different than slightly different to the, to, to, to the control ones. And we, we, we evaluated this and what we saw is that essentially there was a loss of insulation um, at these domain boundaries. Um, and actually, when you have a look at the maps and you, you calculate the fault change between the two, you can also see that there is a decreased level of intra tad interaction. So essentially, a loss of compaction inside those, uh, those domains, and a gain of inter interactions. And as I said, this is the same no matter whether we want to have a look at uh, alpha manitin or triptolite. And what this, so essentially, the main, uh, the main summary for this part is that TAR and TAR boundaries seem to be independent of transcription, um, uh, at least for their establishment during psychotic genome activation. So just to update um, the picture that I've shown you so far is that transcription inhibition weakens, weaker, we, we produces weaker domain structure, but doesn't abolish um, the domain structure. Um, and then quickly, uh, I'll, sh I'll show you what happens with CELDA, because CELDA was uh, the transcription factor that was a top hit here um, in, 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 our, in our survey of, of domains that were in richer regions of open chromatin. 
Um, and actually what we saw, so we generated uh, high C data for cell that knocked down embryos that we obtained from Chris Ruslow. And what you can see is that there's still chromatin organization in these embryos. The embryos are completely non-viable. So essentially they develop until nuclear cycle uh, 14, but then these embryos never, never gastrulate. Um, but when you have a look at the fold change maps, you see now that the changes in the, in the 3D genome are slightly different. Um, and we were able to understand these changes in the 3D genome when we ranked uh, the genome based on the level of CELDA binding, where you can see that regions that are highly targeted by CELDA um, go through an, a loss of, of insulation. And essentially, the way this looks like is if you focus on this region over here where you have a very clear domain boundary, this is a region that is uh, bound by CELDA and bound by rna 2 uh, when we have a look at this in cell the depleted embryos, you see that the boundary essentially is gone and you have um, a domain fusion. So just to complete the picture, uh, what we see is that cell the depletion produces a loss of a subset of boundaries. In this particular case, for example, the separation that you'll have between these two domains. Now, this left us actually uh, with a number of, uh, of open questions that we're really very keen on, on, on looking at. And this is what I'm gonna talk about for the rest of today. Um, and also I have shown you these embryos and I have shown you this video earlier, and it looks like the embryo is really very homogeneous at that particular stage, but this is actually not the case. It's very well known that uh, patterning in the embryo has already started actually, you know, away from the, how all the morphogen gradients uh, are determined um, uh, by the maternal position. Um, and here I'm just showing you uh, patterning of specific transcription factors that are located in at nucleus cycle 14 in very different parts of, of, of the embryos in the nuclei of, of this embryo. So the questions that we have here is how heterogeneous uh, chromatin conformation is gonna be in these embryos? And the second question, do developmental transcription factors and gene regulation affect genome organization? So Liz uh, Ing Simmons, a, a, a postdoc in the lab, decided to, to, to target these questions. Um, and to do that, what Liz did was she resorted to the dorsal ventral pattern in system in Drosophila. Uh, and this is what I'm going to show you now in this video. So now this video is a cross section of the embryo. So now this is the anterior posterior axis and the dorsal ventral axis. So these embryos are essentially just is a cross section around here. Um, and the, the, the dorsal ventral patterning is controlled by a transcription factor that is called dorsal. Um, so what you can see in these embryos, uh, so essentially histones are labeled here in magenta and the concentration of dorsal protein is uh, labeled in green. And what you can see is that uh, there is a high level of dorsal in the nucleus of the ventral side of the embryo. Whereas if you have a look at the, at the upper part of the embryo, what you can see is that dorsal is essentially excluded from the, from the, from the nuclei that are gonna be in the dorsal part uh, of the embryo. It's a little bit of tricky nomenclature as with everything in Drosophila. Um, but essentially, this is important because the gradient of, uh, of nuclear dorsal concentration is going to determine the tissue specification that you you're going to have in these embryos. So low levels of dorsal at the, to at the dorsal part of the embryo are going to lead to dorsal ectoderm. Middle levels of dorsal are going to lead to neuroectoderm. And high levels of dorsal in the ventral part of the embryo are going to lead to mesoderm. Okay, so this is what will happen in normal embryos. And the nice thing is that there is, uh, ge there is genetic mutants that have mutations that affect uh, the toll pathway in the way that uh, dorsal is, uh, is released and, and is, is allowed to go into the nucleus that result in uniform gradients of, uh, of uh, dorsal concentration in the nucleus of these embryos along the dorsal ventral axis. So these are the three uh, mutants that I'm gonna be talking about today. You don't need to, to, to worry about the names. I'll try and make this simple. Um, but essentially we have uh, this uh, mutant here, um, GD7, that uh, produces a low level of, uh, of dorsal in the entire embryo. And this is gonna to lead to an embryo that is produced of mostly dorsal ectoderm. And um, this uh, tall mutant produces uh, Median levels and it's going to lead to uh, all neuroectoderm. And the tall 10B mutant uh, has high levels of dorsal across the entire uh, axis, and this produces an all mesoderm embryo. So we wanted to use these embryos to now see what happens in terms of gene regulation and in terms of three dimensional chromatin organization. So the first thing that we did was to look at differential uh, enhancer analysis, and we identified enhancers that are specific for one of the three uh, mutants. So in this particular case, you can see dorsal uh, ectoderm enhancers, uh, 
but we have a set of new ectoderm specific enhancers and a set of mesoderm specific en enhancers. And we know that this works uh, fairly well because actually when we have a look at uh, enhancer gene associations, we can see that these genes are specifically upregulated in their respective mutant where the enhancer is being used. Um, now, so the first thing that we want to ha have a look at, and one of the things that I want to make a point about today here is that tissue specific genes and enhancers tend to be located inside domains. So in the first part of the talk, I, I told you about these domain boundaries and how there was expression in these domain boundaries. I didn't have time to go through that, um, but essentially those regions are going to correspond to uh, regions where housekeeping genes are mostly located. But when you have a look at, um, at uh, tissue-specific developmental genes, what you can see is that these genes tend to be longer, such as, for example, the one that I'm showing you here, which is a gene called F. Um, and here you have the enhancers. So this is specifically expressed in mesoderm. So it's a tall 10B uh, in, in, in tall 10B. Uh, and this is just this, you know, it's quite contrasting with uh, the housekeeping genes that you see located uh, nearby. So let's test this and what actually what we, same as what, what other people have, uh, have reported before, what we can see here is that tissue specific genes tend to be larger and it tend to be in larger domains and tend to be in regions that are uh, less uh, gene dense. Now, the next question that we had is how heterogeneous uh, gene expression is in these mutants? Um, and this was, uh, you know, th this was just a question that we had that, uh, it's, it's, it's important because we know that these mutations are affecting the gradient of uh, uh, nuclear dorsal. But I have already told you before that there is a different axis of patterning. So we wanted to see how different uh, these embryos were. And to do this, we turn to single cell RNA seq. So we produce single cell RNA seq for control embryos um, at, at uh, two to three hours post fertilization, so approximately nuclear cycle 14. And you can see here that we detect about 15 uh, different clusters of cells that uh, correspond to some of these uh, different cell fates that we're going to have in this embryo. So mesoderm, ectoderm, some uh, neural tissue, and here, for example, pole cells. So these are going to be the germ cells um, of the embryos. Um, and then the question is, okay, so how does this look like for the, for the mutants? Um, so this is, again, the control where I have specifically highlighted uh, the ectoderm part, mesoderm, and neural parts of the embryo. Uh, and what we can see is that the specific embryos that are meant to be producing just this one of these different types, they're severely depleted in the other types of cells that they're not meant to be producing. For example, here, dorsal ectoderm embryos, you can see that you don't have uh, uh, the mesoderm cluster. Same here for neuroectoderm, you don't have also the mesoderm cluster. Um, and there's specific region over here that you're going to see in a second that is, also, that is also missing, where dorsal ectoderm enhancers are actually being expressed. And in the mesoderm, you see that the mesoderm is very clearly represented, but the ectoderm and the neural part are actually underrepresented um, in terms of the total number of, uh, of nuclei that we obtain from these embryos. And we can validate this by looking at the expression of genes with tissue-specific enhancers. So you see these regions over here, which are specifically expressed in, in dorsal ectoderm, and they're not expressed in the, other, in, the other, um, in the other mutants. And it's the same thing if we do the same exercise looking for uh, mutant-specific expression. So the summary so far for the second part is that I've shown you that we have these embryos that essentially produce different tissues. These tissues have different chromatin states and different enhancer usage, and they have very different gene expression levels. So now the key question is, do these tissues actually have them three-dimensional chromatin organization? And it'll be great to be in the same room now because I will ask you to, you know, to put your hands up and then tell me what is that you think is going to happen. Um, so I will try and I'll tell you. Um, but so essentially what we find is that the 3D genome, uh, tissue-specific genes, is maintained across these different tissues. So I'm going to focus on this particular case. So this is a dorsal ectoderm and uh, three, uh, three loci. So three, uh, a locus with three, these three different genes, DOC1, uh, 2, and 3. This is specifically used uh, in dorsal uh, ectoderm, as you can see here, for these enhancers. Um, and I, I want to draw your attention to the fact that if you have a look at this, this is a really very small region of the genome, okay? So have a look at the scale bar uh, of 20, 25 kilobase, kilobases. So if we have a look at um, how this 3D genome looks like in neuroectoderm or in mesoderm, it looks absolutely identically, even though the enhancers are, uh, and gene expression is specifically for dorsal ectoderm and it doesn't appear in the other tissues. 
So this really suggests that uh, there's the three, same three-dimensional chromatin organization that is maintained across these uh, three different tissues. Now, in the interest of time, I'm just going to show you this example uh, only here, but we also did, did this genome-wide. And to do this genome-wide and to do this in a quantitative manner, we turn to um, a new technique that we have developed in the lab that is called CHESS. It stands for Comparison of High-C Experiments Using Structural Similarity. Um, so this is a paper that uh, came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, and essentially, here we turn into strategies that are using computer vision to be able to uh, find differences in, in, in images. So it's a little bit like what Google Photos or Facebook will do to tag you and your friends or your pet in your photos. So you have a reference image, um, and then essentially uh, the algorithm can compute um, how confident it is that uh, a, a photo on another day looks like you in your reference image. So if you if one day you look like this, um, then you're gonna have a, a high SIM, which is the way this uh, structural similarity um, score is actually called. And if the light conditions are bad, you're gonna have a low level of, uh, of similarity. So now you can do this with uh, high C data because essentially high C data are pretty much the same as this black and white um, images that I'm showing you here. So you can have um, a, a region of high C uh, in, for example, one condition, and then compare this region against all the conditions. And this is gonna give you whichever level of similarity um, you're going to have between your reference and the regions that you're comparing this against. So one listed this comparison for the three different mutants, looking at, at differences with control embryos, uh, what she saw is that there, was, there were genome-wide no differences, um, whether uh, there were differentially expressed genes or not differentially expressed genes. And again, what this suggests is that what I have shown you before of the maintenance of the 3D genome in the different tissue types is something that we actually see genome. So this essentially brings me to, to, to my summary of the second part, uh, where I have uh, hopefully uh, convinced you that three-dimensional chromatin conformation and gene regulation are unlinked. Essentially, they're independent, at least at this, at this particular developmental stage. Um, so I have shown you that we use these uh, mutant embryos that lead into, uh, into these different tissues. Um, and I have shown you that these different tissues have different gene expression and different chromatin state. However, the three-dimensional chromatin organization is really very similar between tissues, even at tissue-specific genes. And what this really suggests is that chromatin organization and gene regulation are independent at this developmental stage. Now, what these results uh, will suggest in a broader context is that maybe this domain organization that we see here acts as a scaffold that allows gene regulation. So as long as you have the right domain, uh, there will be other signals, for example, transcription factors, um, that will determine, so binding of transcription factors, that will determine whether the gene is expressed or is not expressed. But the three-dimensional chromatin organization will remain the same. Um, so if you, if you want to find more about uh, this new story from the lab, we have a paper on the bioarchive that I invite you to, to go and have a look at. With this, I'm just getting to my acknowledgements. Um, so as I said uh, today, this, this, is a, this is a new project from the lab that has been single-handedly run by uh, Liz Eng, Eng, Eng Simmons, super talented postdoc in the lab. Um, and we have actually uh, performed this work in collaboration with uh, Matthias Marovic's lab at uh, and Russian Vide at Stockholm University and some new data that we have also uh, uh, from um, uh, Mike Levine's lab in Princeton. Um, so thank you very much for your attention and I'll be happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Juanma, uh, for this beautiful presentation and beautiful results. Um, so we have uh, several questions. Uh, we'll start with the first one by Kuljit Sandhu. So uh, is Zelda of maternal origin? Uh, yes, yeah, so Zelda is, uh, is, is deposited maternally. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> Okay, there is a question by Vipin Kumar. So do you see differences at a more global level, let's say AB compartments? Yeah, this is a very yeah. this is a very good question. I don't think I have the right backup slide here, but actually you can go and have a look at it in the preprint. So we perform um, 
systematic aggregate analysis where we go and have a look at uh, compartment, uh, including compartment strength, saddle plots, uh, aggregate TAD analysis, aggregate loop analysis, and so on. Uh, and what we see is that actually the maps are really, really very, very similar. So we, we really don't see uh, any major differences. I should say that we see some differences um, and the differences are mostly in regions uh, where there will be um, signal caused by uh, translocations. And, and this one thing I should say here, so uh, these embryos have uh, balancer chromosomes, which essentially is a genetic tool to make sure that you can keep those embryos uh, with, uh, and you can keep the right markers so you can keep identifying those embryos. Um, and essentially these balancer chromosomes are gonna be highly rearranged. Uh, uh, this actually really nice work by, um, by Yad and, and Eileen that have actually um, looked at this uh, also uh, just looking at changes uh, mean, uh, associated with balancer chromosomes. So here, the only, the only changes that we see in the 3D genome is actually due to, to translocations. And, and it's signal that comes not because the region there will actually be different, but just because uh, the artif artifactual signal that you get by having a genome that is not assembled the same way that the linear assembly of the, of the balancer chromosome will be. Okay. Uh, we have a question by uh, Vera. Hi, so thanks for the very nice talk. So again, I, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to ask the same question, but in a slightly different way. So are you, are you sure that there aren't any changes in the long range interactions? Because you know, whenever, whenever you look at a small region, or even if you look at a large region, but you use high C, unless you have very deep sequencing, you're going to sort of miss the really long range interactions. So my question is, could it be that these small domains are kept constant as 3D organization is concerned, but the way they are interacting with each other could change? And also, I wanted to know if, if you think that there is anything really special about this phase uh, of the development of Drosophila and of Drosophila, because, you know, in, um, in human cells, we, we see very, very specific chromatin structure. Um, so somehow, you know, is this a, a paradox? Is that, do, do you know exactly why that is? Um, yeah, so those are two very good questions, uh, Vera, thank you. Um, so the first one, I don't think that we're missing the changes here because of either not having enough resolution or not looking at long range interaction. So when we have a, lo a look at long range interaction and we have a look at some of these loops, uh, I mean, I must say, the majority of those loops actually they're polycom mediated, um, and so they're you know they, they are they're gonna this is gonna be a repressive uh, state repressive chromatin state. We don't see any change in, in those loops uh, also in the in the three different uh, in the three different um, genetic backgrounds that we have in here, um, and the regions that I'm showing you here. Uh, you know, at the moment, this is a 2 kb resolution. We have new data coming that is a 500 base, base per resolution. We see looping for some enhancers and promoters, and we also see that this is actually also not changing. Um, so, you know, maybe this is something that has to do more with this specific developmental time point. In Drosophila, actually, it's been shown that later during development, um, and I think so, uh, work by uh, Alistair Bottinger actually has shown this, um, there are, there's actually differences, uh, or if you compare, for example, KC cells with uh, early embryos, so there's specific differences. Um, where these differences come from and, and why are these differences occurring is something that I think is really very interesting that we will need to address. But what we're showing here is that we don't think that those differences are necessary in order for differential gene regulation to occur because at this stage, you don't observe these differences, yet you have a very different enhancer usage and gene expression usage. Did that clarify the question? Yes, but at the same time, uh, if, if you consider the long range interactions, you will be missing them. Because exactly if you say that you increase the resolution, the more you increase the resolution, the less you have the depth necessary to see the uh, sort of uh, long range interactions that are rare, but present. So I, uh, I don't know. I really, I really, I really don't think so. Um, you know, I mean, I can, let, let me just, let me just. Have you done you. any fish? Uh, uh, so actually, so we, we haven't done fish for this ourselves. Um, but, um, uh, but actually, uh, Alin Furlong's lab did. Um, and actually we, you know, we can see that some of these long range interactions that one can also detect using 4C-seq. 
we can detect them using using high C exactly the same way. So, uh, you know, the, the the Drosophila genome is 17 times smaller than the human or mouse genome. Yeah. Um, and here you can really see uh, so this is just you know the maps and some of the some of the signal that I was uh, mentioning earlier regarding this the, the weird signal that we're gonna that we're gonna have for in the for the balancer chromosomes. Um, we, we can detect these long range interactions and long range changes. So definitely, I don't think that there is an issue here with with uh, with um, with resolution. And the other thing that I should say here, um, I'll just go to my other backup slide. I don't know whether Marcelo showed this yesterday because unfortunately I missed his talk. But actually they have now shown that these interactions, uh, this is exactly the same locus that I have, uh, that I have shown you, the doc one, two, three. Um, and they see that there's also no change in how these interactions actually occur within the same embryo. So they'll be looking at nuclei that will be in the in the dorsal or the ventral part, and they, they see that there are no differences there. Um, so you know, I, I think it's just that we can really go and dissect in very, very fine level of detail what what happens here with with Drosophila, uh, and this regulation seems to be slightly different. I must say, you know, and uh, I'm sure you're also aware of this, um, the way the Drosophila 3D genome is organized is slightly different. Here you don't have you have CTCF, but it's a different CTCF. It's not meant to. It's not. not it's, it's not. Yeah. Well, it doesn't have the same function. Uh, yeah. You have other insulator proteins and, and the, the overall organization of the genome, even in the linear um, scale, is really very different. So I think there's a lot of things that we really need to take into consideration to have a full understanding of what happens here. Yeah, I think that's probably the case. Uh, it's, it's a special, I mean, yes, I've, I've seen Marcelo's data and um, it, it's definitely interesting because when we will understand the differences, uh, maybe, maybe we will actually understand this better. Thanks. Uh, so next question uh, by Mathieu, Mathieu Lavigne. So I think he will uh, Hello. directly the question. Yeah. Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah. Hello. Very yeah. nice talk. Um, I have okay. a question about uh, what you mentioned about the RNA pol 2 uh, inhibition. So uh, you prevent transcription elongation, but as you said, there is still RNA pol 2 binding at those regions. So what do you think could be their function there in order to maintain those domains? Yeah, absolutely. This is a really very nice, uh, very nice question. Something that we already, uh, you know, discuss uh, uh, to 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 a fair extent in in the previous work. Um, I think here probably the um, uh, the organization of the pre-initiation complex and recruitment of polymerase might actually be part of the reason why you have insulation at those regions, simply just because this is heavy molecular machinery. And then this might actually preclude from that region to be compacted uh, one way or another. And then therefore you have insulation because of the binding of this, uh, of this, uh, molecular, of this molecular machinery. Um, it, this is something that I think it will be, you know, I think data that other people have then gone and looked into in mammalian systems and also maybe using Decron systems would sort of suggest the same. Um, because as, as far as I understand, uh, there's no clear evidence uh, of really being able to remove the pre-initiation. It's, it's a very difficult thing to do to be able to get rid of uh, um, RNA pol 2 recruitment and pre-initiation complex formation. Well, so, I, something that I, we're definitely trying. Actually, uh, I could suggest something because we've done it in the lab. Uh, we use this uh, uh, salt approach, but I don't know if it's going to be working in your embryos, but in cell lines, it works really well. Uh, it's from David Bentley's lab where uh, you incubate cells with uh, sodium chloride, uh, 500 millimolars, and uh, this is sufficient to prevent PIC formation. So it would be quite nice if you can do it. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's an interesting suggestion, actually. I, I think, I mean, I, I, we will need to go and have a look at how one would be able to do that in embryos. Um, okay, I can email you the paper if you want. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Um, okay, so we have a question by uh, Julien, Julien Mosico-Nati. Hi, uh, Juanma. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I'm glad that you uh, brought this slide from uh, Marcelo, who indeed was showing uh, this to us yesterday, and I was really amazed by the clear uh, looping signal that he sees using high M. One of the questions that was asked to Marcelo is if you can see you looking at the same locus with the same accuracy, the same loops with high C. Uh, 
Can you uh, tell us about that? Yeah, I can tell you about this. Um, uh, let me see. Um, I mean, so the the answer is the answer is yes, actually. Um, this is not the one that I'm meant to be. So it's, I mean, it's, it's, I don't have another solution in this particular, in, in the slide that I'm using here. Um, so, you know, so this is the doc one, two, three, and it, it's really not very clear with this particular, uh, in, in this particular high C map. I mean, the, you know, so I'm gonna show you the three of them. You can sort of see a little bit of high levels of signal here, here, there, which correspond to some of these contacts um, that we see between uh, the uh, doc one, two, three. We have higher resolution data for, you know, for these embryos. I don't have this here, but we we can see the, the we can see those groups. Thank you. 